Good evening, everybody. Now, I'm just a simple man, and my name is Noah Foster. And welcome once again to this week's episode of 205 Live Matters. Tonight we'll be discussing the championship match from the Elimination Chamber kickoff show. This week's episode, 205 Live. And an interesting tweet sent out by Tony Nese in perspective to the kickoff show and how a fan views it versus the business. But before that, allow me to introduce y'all to my guest tonight. You might know him from his long-running series, The Wrestling Rundown, on his YouTube channel. He is known as the Berman of Boston, the current No DQ NX Team Champion, Mr. Owen Finch. Owen, how are you? I'm doing well. Um, excited to be on here. Um, even though I've been on NoDQ.com before, if you've watched, you know, um, NXT Party, but I'm very excited. Um, very excited to b- talk about 205 Live. I'm glad this series exists on NoDQ.com because I've I've been wanting it for a while. So let's, let's just get talking about the show. All right, sounds good. Thank you so much. With that, let's get started. So why don't we first talk about the incredible championship match from this past Sunday on the Elimination Chamber kickoff show. Folks, I will rant, but in respect to my family sleeping, don't expect me to be super loud tonight. Anyway, so this match was really good, I thought. It was a great back-and-forth bout. We basically got um, all the best hits. There was uh, a test of strength between the two. Buddy Murphy showing how he's the unstoppable force 205 Live, just eating chops from Akira Dozawa, having no effect on him. To the point that I frustrated him so much, they went up to the outside of the ring, and he ends up wagging his hand on the post. That was dumb. I don't know why people always fall for that, it seems. But following that, Murphy, he shows off his power. It comes into play. He plants Tozawa. There's a snap run and a basement drop kick. And then Buddy catches the first highlight of the match, in my opinion. Buddy catches Akira Tozawa out of his suicide headbutt attempt. Feet not even touch the floor. Just catches him in midair and just lifts him up vertically and plants him with a German suplex. That looked nasty. And then here's... Here's my biggest gripe of this match, besides the fact it's on kickoff. Why the fuck did you have to cut away to an interview segment with the New Day talking about Kobe getting a massage for the finest service from Mr. Booty's work? Why the fuck could not this been before the damn kickoff match? Are you kidding me? You have 45 minutes to talk about the rest of the card, including this main event. Not to mention the time you had afterwards when this match was fucking over and you cut away. And I might add, there was no rest spot. It wasn't like a crappy rest spot when you get Chris Lee knows best or Temptation on him. Fuck those shows, too, during SmackDown and Raw. Absolute stupid nonsense, in my opinion. Well, I digress. Uh, before I go any further in this match, Owen, what are your thoughts on this whole cutaway segment? Um, I hate the cutaway segments because uh, I think what makes the commercials unique, um, just on, like, you know, live television and is... The fans get to see some of the match that you don't get to see, so they can miss, like, a highlight or something like that. Um, but I hate that they did it for this match with the New Day interview, because, like you said, they easily could have done this um, any other time on the show, because I believe they just showed another Mustafa Ali promo on the show that they had already shown on SmackDown, so why couldn't they show it there? Um, it really, I just thought it was very disrespectful, because it's already bad enough to on the kickoff. Um so it shows that they don't care because we know they don't care about the kickoff. Uh, Survivor Series from last year is the biggest example of that. And the fact that you just, like, took away their shine, um, if, if you just, you know, what, don't even put the match on the kickoff if you're just going to do that type of crap. It's very, I think it's very stupid. Um, so I completely agree. Anyway, <clears throat> let's uh, get back to the match because it did continue uh, during this where Buddy was maintaining control with a couple of submission holds. We get a couple more uh, chops, and then there's a forearm to Buddy Murphy, a vicious forearm, by the way, to Buddy Murphy. And then as Tozawa goes um, for his top rolled senton bomb for the first time in this match, uh, Buddy uh, pulls him off, and eventually we get an iron octopus attempt, which Buddy breaks up immediately, once again showcasing his strength into a Vicious looking backbreaker into a cover. Not near fall, but a cover. And then he drives the knee into Tosawa's back. And again, we get some submission holes, abdominal stretch. Your body is not supposed to bend like that. And then both men basically try to play off each other's strength, both attempting for a hip toss. Eventually, Buddy gets sent over the top rope by Akira Tozawa. And he comes back into the ring, furious, runs straight into a kick. Akira then basically goes 
straight into um, the lower back, um, favoring it from all those uh, submission holds. But following that, Akira be in the top rope, antics he does. He goes for missile drop kick, hits him, and then we get a uh, pump kick into the corner. There's a suplex counter into a backdrop driver, one of Akira Dazawa's phase where he slides underneath the opponents and goes for that vicious uh, German suplex attempt. Following that, he capitalizes with a shining wizard to a cover. Still not enough. So once again, he goes for his uh, top round senton, you know, his coup de gras, I guess you could say. And uh, once again, he runs into a uh, kick. And Akira, he falls up with his own kick. You know, we get a little bit of exchange. Akira catches him with a roundhouse kick. Then Buddy attempts to uh, plant Akira again. And from the top rope, he gets, I think, a Frankenstein, basically. That led into a nice uh, near fall, which got our first real pop in the eyes with uh, This Is Awesome Chance. And I will say this. Big Joe's has been extremely generic with how many times he says take down to the point I'm like, shut up. But I did say one thing that was credible to me during this segment. He said, this is what 205 Live is all about. And that's why I keep stressing. You get incredible back and forth action worthy they be on the kickoff show. And I'll talk about that stance in a moment. But anyway, following this, we get a crossbody roll through by uh, Murphy. And uh, we basically get uh, two Murphy's Law attempts, which is Buddy Murphy's finisher. He couldn't hit it, though. We get a drop knee and a knee strike into a suplex into a cover. Very nice exchange, by the way. Buddy Murphy um, still basically maintaining control of the match. He's basically talking trash, teasing Tozawa. We get an exchange of punches. There's a back and forth, but Akira, he's just eating it up. It's, most, it's mostly like he's fire, it's firing him up. That prosciutto, his fighting spirit, and basically he goes for his fake out jab. It gets countered once. And then we get a combination kick and a kick and a stomp. Then a missed knee strike by Murphy, which then leads to the fake out jab by uh, Akira Tozawa. On this, we get a nice clothesline into another beautiful, and I believe Marvin Nell is on record for saying this from the Cruiserweight Classic, one of the most beautiful German suplexes you will see into a bridge cover. Still not enough. And then the crowd gets behind Akira. Now they're seeing, oh, he's credible. He might be able to do it. Get a lot of hot chance. But anyway, moving on, we get Buddy stopping once again the senton attempt, but this time it nearly costs him as Akira capitalizes by basically hanging Murphy between the middle rope, and he does plant his uh, top rope sent on to the back, the lower back of Buddy Murphy, into a cover. So you're thinking that would be it, but no. The commentators brought up that they picked the second rope has more give versus the mat, which may have been the reason why uh, Buddy Murphy was able to kick out of that, because under normal circumstances, that probably would have been it. Yeah. But following that, we get a beautiful uh, cheeky Nando's kick, Almost from uh, Buddy Murphy as Akira Zara once again tries to go for the top of the Zenton bomb. But Akira, he counters the uh, attempted super kick from Buddy with his own super kick, very unique by the way from his position, into an insane inverted Hurricane Rana, which then he just keeps capitalizing on this, staying on Buddy with two suicide headbutt dives, both successful. And then we get another Zenton, and then Murphy, he goes in for the attack, and he gets. Like I said, he gets hanged between the ropes. But anyway, uh, following this, though, we get Akira Dozawa with all the momentum in the world. He goes ha. We get, though, that jumping knee strike from Buddy Murphy, one of his trademarks, which eventually leads to Murphy's Law. And literally after that, one, two, three. So Buddy Murphy once again uh, retains in a very um, high-class bout where both men showcase their strengths. Akira Dozawa show off his greatest hits, including the Iron Octopus. I don't think he has, I think he has yet to actually beat somebody with that submission. It still looks nice, though. But the ironic thing, I think, really about this overall to me is that the fact is it started at the clock having 25 minutes left, and at the end of this match, the clock was down to 8 minutes. This bout went for over 10 minutes, practically 12 minutes when you think about it, and yet they still interrupted it with a freaking interview segment, and yet somehow this still wasn't placed in the main card. Oh, and what are your thoughts overall about this match? I thought this match was uh, really good. Um, I really, uh, the Cruiserweight match is always, like, one of the highlights of uh, the pay-per-views now. Uh, you know, ever since it's rebranded, uh, you know, last year, actually, around this time, pretty much. Um, and I just thought it was really good, really good back-and-forth match. Um, I think it's Akira Tozawa's uh, best match that he's had since, uh, you know, he's come to WWE. I'm kind of, I mean, And I'm actually, like, you know, legitimately mean that, because I know a lot of people just say that, and then obviously they'll find, like, another match. I, I'm... I mean that. I think this is his best match uh, since he's joined WWE. And Buddy Murphy continues uh, to build his brand as Cruiserweight Champion. I really like that. 
Um, I think I missed like about five minutes or so because I was getting uh, food at this time and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But um, so that's why, like, I don't think I I, I gave it as a star rating three and a half stars. Uh, but also it, um, it got knocked down to star rating because of that new day thing too. So, uh, but it was a really good cruiserweight match, really good back and forth match. Uh, just everything that cruiserweight wrestling should be. But and I, I liked Buddy Murphy. Um, I like the Murphy's Law, and I like the counters. I liked everything about this match. Um, and there was even points I thought Tozawa actually was going to win the match, so I thought that did its job. Uh, but this match should have been on the kickoff. Uh, this match actually should have taken Braun Strowman versus Baron Corbin's place on the show. Thank Consider- you. Considering the fact that um, I say that now, too, because they just did that match the next night anyway, so why not, you know, have that take that, that, that place, so... Well, in my opinion, Baron Corbin versus Braun Strowman, no disrespect to Braun, but it's just the horrible booking and this pointless feud. It should have been on the kickoff, especially when you saw how it was played out. The funny thing is, Baron Corbin, he's used to kickoff shows. He was on the freaking kickoff with Dean Ambrose back at WrestleMania 33, and that was for the freaking Intercontinental Championship. But you're telling me that this Braun Strowman feud is more worthy of being on the main card versus this Cruiserweight title match? Give me a fucking break. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, before we get into the main show, Caitlin, go follow her, folks. Great person. NodiQ.com forward slash Caitlin. She shared this tweet with me that Tony Nese uh, shared in response to a fan that shares kind of a similar stance to what I did. So according to this, sent out by uh, at rnews0683, he basically says, and I quote, if WWE Triple H Mr. Man truly cared, they should be in the main portion of the show, not the kickoff. If you want more people invested in 205 Live, put them as part of the show. But Tony Nese, here's his rebuttal, and I quote, or it could be a part of anything, but that's not the case. People without the network can view the kickoff, and the company puts trust in us to help sell the full show. Not sure they would put something they could care less about in that spot. How about a positive outlook? Now, before I get your stance on this, let me just say this, because me and Cindy both had our rebuttals to this. Cindy basically said this, and I agree with her on most of these points. She basically uh, says that, in a way, this is what WWE really has to say, but it is his opinion. It's really, for business sake, yes, it's a good thing, because it's the most exposure you get to people aware of the network and of the product. But from that standpoint, it doesn't feel right from a fan standpoint, unless you put someone that people are not familiar with on the Cruiserweight um, title picture. Like Humberto Carrillo, how many people really know him? How many people know the Gaza family? But again, it, it's the opinion of whatever Tony says. But Cindy says that the Cruiserweights, they deserve better. Majority of people may not see eye to eye, but in her opinion, they deserve better. The Cruiserweights deserve better in WWE. And yes, there's a ton of content in WWE already, in wrestling in general. I mean, WWE itself has four other brands, Raw, SmackDown, NXT, NXT UK. But still, Based on, especially that Baron Corbin Braun Strowman match, this should be showcased in a better light. And I basically followed up with her on that by treating this as you almost can call 205 Live the redheaded stepchild with the way it's treated. The fact that it's been on kickoff show now for TLC, for the Royal Rumble, and for the Mission Chamber. But yet, somehow, ironically, it was not on kickoff during Survivor Series. They gave that to the freaking 10 on 10. Survivor Series elimination match between the tag teams, which also fell points since most of those tag teams were jobbers or not even on TV. But I understand also how, from a business standpoint, this is your largest viewing audience versus their time in the Indies. This is the most exposure. This is the most money they're making, et cetera, et cetera. But like I said, I feel like on the network, you do get more viewers from exposure because it's the main show. It's the main product. It's the main thing they're pushing towards. And the fact that they're putting these on the kickoff and interrupting them with these pointless interview segments that could happen so much beforehand, it just seems ridiculous to me. Oh, and what is your stance on Tony Nese's stance on the placement and use of the cruiserweights? Well, first I'll say I think Tony Nese is just trying to, you know, uh, kind of support WWE because he doesn't want to, like, lose his job and things like that. So he's trying to kind of, you know, support them. And when it comes down to this, I completely disagree with his comments. Um, just because, like we talk, talked about, the crew, the kickoff doesn't matter. They'll put, like, you know, they, they won't even announce the kickoff match sometimes until, like, three days before the pay-per-view. Literally. I think 
heavy no DQ predictions that goes on this channel. Uh, the kickoff's like never announced um, ahead of time, pretty much. It's not announced until after literally it goes up. And so if they really cared that much about the kickoff, why is that match always put out there the last minute? Also, to uh, you know, um, like I said, Survivor Series, uh, mm. when, you know, walk clean sweep SmackDown, uh, they... Don't give me, they, don't give they, me they, started on that, but continue. Yeah. Um, and obviously, too, the commentators that night at Survivor Series kept saying, no, SmackDown did win one, but Michael Cole would say, it's the kickoff, it doesn't matter. They themselves literally said, the kickoff doesn't matter. Um, I personally think you give the Cruiserweights the main card, because at Survivor Series... People were into the Cruiserweight match. People were chanting 205 Live. People loved the Cruiserweight match. Um, and I don't know what the hell happened. Um, how can they make the main card at Survivor Series, but they can't make the main card, like like you said, at, you know, TLC, uh, Royal Rumble, um, you know, Elimination Chamber. I can understand the Royal Rumble because I think uh, if the – actually, the Royal Rumble, they should have been on the main card because uh, – you know, they they could have followed the Royal Rumble match with the woman because what happened where well, Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles went wrong was because they had to go follow the woman's match and it had to be like a slow plotted match. If the cruiserweights had been able to go out there and do their thin, it would have woken the crowd up. So I completely um, agree. Because both Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles, they're very technical based wrestlers. You don't get a lot of high, hot, fast hot spots with them. The closest thing you get out of those two is a phenomenal form. No disrespect to them, but that crowd was just burnt out. They didn't want a slow-paced spiral or a technical bout. They wanted something to either wake them up, otherwise they just went to go get a shirt or grab a hot dog or take a break. So that was just bad booking, I think, on WWE's part. In my opinion, yes, I believe the Fair 4-Way should have put, um, been put there. But, again, it's WWE yeah. booking. Who's going to argue with Vince McMahon? Bottom line is, I feel like Tony Nese is speaking from a business standpoint because everyone fears freedom of speech under the reign of Vince McMahon. And also another thing, when was the last time Tony Nese was involved in even a kickoff match with that demo? I think it's really easy for him to say with the fact he hasn't even been involved on the freaking matches on these shows. Yeah. I mean, if I a, remember two Austin Aries and Neville, Neville's match was left off the WrestleMania DVD and they didn't get like a big payday or anything from that Correct. match. Correct, they didn't get warranties and that eventually led to both men's departures and I honestly don't blame them. That was yeah. very disrespectful and one of the better matches on that card too. What's the most memorable thing about WrestleMania 33? The Undertaker retiring and freaking John Cena proposing to Nikki Bella. whoop de doo I guess the hardest was a nice thing too but yeah. one off topic. That's another story but, but yeah. Business versus fan. Bottom line, guys, they belong on the main card, in my opinion, because 205 Live matters. Simple as that. Exactly. All right. So with that, let's get into this week's show. So I kind of called uh, this week's show to an extent. I called a squash match. I called uh, the involvement of Roberto Carrillo. And I kind of called uh, Mike Canellas further dissension into his downward spiral. But let's get into the show first. So we first start off with this time Drake Maverick giving us a recap of the uh, championship match from this past Sunday and the direction of the 205 Live division up towards to WrestleMania. I like the, I find it interesting they're using the same approach that they did last year, except they're only using half the men, probably because they got like half the time. So yeah. keep close that we are going to figure out the next contender for Buddy Murphy's Cruiserweight title with an eight-man single elimination tournament. And we don't know none of the participants at this point, but he said he's going to announce some later tonight. And both matches tonight are crucial towards those participant choices. He announces both matches tonight, being Roberto Carrillo versus TJP, who has not been on for a while. And he expresses the point that Roberto Carrillo has really taken the brand by storm. But TJP, he's experienced dangerous submissions game. And then we talk about the next match he says on tonight, the main event, Mike Canales versus Sergey Alexander. Mike Canales impressing in his previous performances against D. Brian Kendrick and uh, uh, I forget Kalisto. The Thank you, Kalisto. They're all the same almost to me. Jeez. But basically, he's impressed in his performance, and uh, he's facing Sarah Alexander, who's basically like one of the best all-around people on the two of that roster. And yet, here comes Mike again during that spot where he brings up the match, saying that every loss is a step closer to success because no matter where they've been, they've been successful. Maria can know his words herself. So going straight from there, we get the theme, we go straight into the show. Basically, we get Aiden saying that, oh, I'm brutal. he's young, he's hot. Yeah. Like, 
okay, this was weird. That was very weird. <laughs> Drake Maverick, too, also in that intro, talked about how Cedric winning this match can, like, you know, put him back on the rise from his last year one in 2018, too. Um, Correct, because we, before Buddy Murphy became champ, he was the undefeated top-of-the-line guy in 205 Live. Ever since then, it's been kind of a downward spiral for him, too. So both yeah. Mike and Cedric had suffered improvement tonight's main event. But before we got there, we had uh, the opening bout between uh, Roberto Carrillo and TJP. And I thought this was a really nice back-and-forth bout. We had, uh, you know, the famous spots of Roberto Carrillo. He loves doing roll through kicks and springboards. There was a bit of a filling-out process at first with some uh, deep arm drags. There was a monkey flip counter denied. We had a uh, twisting scissors headlock attempt for a while, and then Roberto finally out of it. But another story came into play in this match, not only for proving if you belong in this tournament, but also the whole point of Drew Gulak for better duel for trying to bring Roberto Carrillo into the fold. Drew Gulak and Jack Gallagher, they come out to ringside to watch his match, which I was like, oh, okay. And I hear Drew Gulak talking about, we talked about this, and you could tell he was coaching him throughout the match, egging him on, uh, telling him, go for this or don't go for this, because, you know, Drew Gulak believes in a no-fly zone. Although he did uh, support Roberto Carrillo when he did that uh, top rope uh, maneuver later on in the match. I also feel like he helped Roberto Carrillo get out of that vicious submissions hold. But anyway, oh, yeah, like the uh, <clears throat> the inverted STF where he did like the yeah. Dono escape with the leg crossed. Yeah, it's very impressive, by the way. But anyway, talking about a few more spots in this match, we get um, really the first spot where TJP regained control is when Roberto Carrillo went shoulder first to the post, and TJP he's working on the arm, he wrenches the arm back, he constantly kicks the arm, he tosses the arm. I will say this for TJP, very calculated. He had like a very different look though tonight in this match too. I feel like his gear almost reminded me a bit of a Dolph Ziggler. I do hope he's not becoming the Dolph Ziggler of 205 Live. But no. it certainly seems that way. All he's missing is a record scratch at this point. Just go... But he also uh, has matter. some new tattoos and stuff, too. From yeah, a, a very, very, like, you know, carefree, bad boy type look. I don't know where the hell this came from. Including, like, his guitar theme with the Mega Man music. But anyway... Yeah, so we get multiple times. There's a uh, body manipulation, but Carrillo, he gets uh, some good spots in here. There's the road fruit kick, kip up kick, kind of on the second one after TJP uh, kind of the first one. We get some nice top rope maneuvers. There's a uh, hurricanrana, uh, Casadora special, I believe, is where uh, TJP rolled through into the Moffat STF, as you called it. But Drew yells for reach, reach, and he gets the rope for the rope break. After that, for a while, they have a nice exchange uh, on the apron, and Roberto Creel capitalizes with a missile drop kick to the uh, back of the neck. And then, um, I guess they call it a head salt now, but basically he goes for his signature where he stands head salt, top rope, and just springboards off the side rope into the cover. One, two, three, Roberto Correa with a huge win, beating the first ever in this uh, reincarnation of the Cruiserweight division, Cruiserweight champion. And, of course, Drew Gulak, he's ecstatic. He says, you have so much potential. Young Lion, how about the career, everybody? Cruiserweight. And they raise him on his shoulders. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens next week, and we'll get to that in a moment, ladies and gentlemen. But I thought this was a very nice back-and-forth bout, but as far as what happens to TJP, who knows at this point? What are your overall thoughts and takeaway from this match and Drew Gulak's support? I thought this match was... Uh... Very good. I really like Humberto Carrillo. He's really been impressing me, um, you know, since, well, really since his, like, his NXT days when he was a tag team with Wal Mendoza. Right. Um, but I really liked this match a lot. I thought TJP looked really good. I especially liked when he did um, Pentagon Jr.'s, like, old arm breaker submission when he would break people's arms uh, for Lucha Underground Season 1. Yes. Uh, I really liked that. Um, he's been doing that. He did that to Dominic Dijakovic, too, um, in the World's Collide Tournament as well. One of, um, one of my favorite matches from that tournament. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, this match was just uh, real good. The, the, the way that uh, Humberto Carrillo, too, hits, like, that drop kick, like, he hits it, like, from an angle and stuff. Like, the way he twists his body, no one's body should, like, twist that way. And, yeah. and obviously, he always seems to do, like, springboard arm drag instead of just a normal deep arm drag. It's yeah. very impressive. It's almost like a self it's almost like an unaware assistance from his opponent that allows him to do that. Roberto Correa's got a very impressive arsenal of moves. I'll be interested to see how much Drew Gulak plays into um, changing that. And then um, 
him winning makes sense because he's still like new to the brand, so you want to keep you know establishing his name. Um, and I did like afterwards, like where they celebrated with him and like put the uh, put Humberto Crew on their shoulders and stuff. And I don't think he officially joined the group. I just think he's kind of going along with the flow. It would be right. kind of interesting, like direction, if he actually did turn heel and join up with Gulak and uh, Gallagher. I think that'd be pretty interesting. Um, it'd be a nice swerve. I don't think they will do that swerve because his moves. He, he would have to completely change his move set around and stuff. You're right. Uh, <laughs> but something interesting is maybe. Uh, I was thinking about this during this match. TJP would be a nice fit for him because he mainly does ground-based maneuvers and stuff like that. So um, I think he'd be an interesting fit for this group. Um, and obviously, I know he does some high-flying stuff, but he can obviously, you know, cut that back. And obviously, because he's a heel, Drew Gulak could say, you know, sometimes you have to take high risk because sometimes when Gulak does go high, he will go high risk if he feel like feels like he absolutely has to. So As an absolute last resort, as previous title potential matches have proven. You're absolutely right. He has break his moral, but only when he feels it absolutely needs to. And, I mean, hey, he's not even saying no fly zone anymore, so maybe he's actually flexing to this. Because, again, Alberto Carrillo, he's a bit of a high flyer. Yeah. But so, also, too, uh, <clears throat> you know, anytime he goes to the top rope or something, tries to do a high fly move, it always, it always costs him. So. <laughs> true, true. It's amusing when it happens. I really will be impressed the day he actually does go for a type of maneuver and it works. But anyway, yeah, yeah good opening bout. I'm interested to see where the story goes from here. Moving on. So we start getting, of course, because 205 Live always gives you at least one promo or interview or just built segment. We first get basically, I guess you could say, a self-imposed interview from Tony Nese, hyping himself up. He basically talks about how after last week's incredible no DQ, no DQ, uh, this match, that I saw live, absolutely loved it. He said that how he proved against Nolan Dark, he is the better man. And now, 205 Live, this brand is just his for the taking. It's just a matter of believing in himself. And now that he got through that mental block and basically ran through like he ran his knee through the freaking barricade for the time he barricade against Nolan Dark, he promises to win and become the champ at Mania. So Tony Nese, he's really hyping himself up. Now, could this lead to potential face turn? Could this lead to him facing Buddy Murphy at Mania? Because me and Cindy were talking about this last week, I'm sure you know. We were talking about the next potential candidates for uh, Buddy Murphy's Cruiserweight title and when that would happen. We were not thinking it was going to win until all the way to WrestleMania. We thought they were doing our film match in between a fast lane. Guess we were wrong. One of the candidates we were talking about was Tony Nese. Is this going to lead to a face turn? Is he going to win the tournament? Who knows at this point? What were your um, thoughts on this uh, promo? I thought it was uh, really good. Everything he said makes sense. Um, and I really don't know because uh, he would he, he obviously would they would have to kind of rush his face turn in a way too because uh, he really isn't a face yet. And I guess like they could do an angle where like, you know, Tony Nee starts winning the tournament and stuff and, you know, starts advancing and Buddy Murphy um, is like starting to get worried and, you know, Tony Nese says he wants to win the title or something. Um, and then it leads to Tony Nese winning the tournament and turning face. Because originally he did turn face when uh, last year during the tournament, uh, the right. first one. Um, and then they just kind of randomly dropped it, I think. I don't know why they did, but they just did. Um, and then he became the tag team with Buddy Murphy. So I don't really uh, – I really don't know. Um, it, it also depends to who's in the tournament. Um you know, because we still don't know, like, all the competitors and stuff. Right. Um, it's At really this point, we don't know anybody. <laughs> yeah. It's a really tough question to answer. It would be very unique. I would love to see, you know, t Tony Nese win the Cruiserweight title just because, you know, he's been in 205 Live since the beginning. I think he'd, it would be a nice run for him. But um, it's really – he would have to completely change his gimmick, too, because the whole, you know, abs thing's more of a heel gimmick, too. So um, it, it would be tough. Um, so I – I really, I, I just don't have an answer for you if he should win or not. Because, like I said, I got to wait a few more weeks to see who's in the tournament and stuff too. So, right, and again, and again, they did, they did say later tonight we would learn about some of the, uh, some of the uh, participants in this tournament, which we'll get to, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, moving on, we get uh, Mike Maria backstage. Mike prepping up for his match, but Kayla Braxton, she comes to play in the interview and poses the question: Is it wise for Mike Canellas, based on his um, recent outcomes? to challenge one of the most experienced competitors in 205 Live instead of Alexander. Maria, she takes over the interview with a rebuttal question talking about, do you think 
Mike Canellis, my husband, who has been in the business for 16 years, do you think he's been successful by taking the easy way out and not taking on the toughest competitors? Of course, Kayla, she first thinks this is like a rhetorical question. So, of course, Maria, she reiterates herself and says, that's a real question, Kayla. And, of course, Kayla says no. And I agree. I mean, if you're going to prove you're the best, why not go after the toughest? Maybe, you know, the definition of doing the same thing over and over again is insanity type thing. Philosophy applies here. But I guess it really depends who you're asking. But basically, he says that... Um, Tonight, Maria says that Mike is going to take out the pride of 205 Live and prove why he is the most dangerous man here. She did not refer at all to this being the match, as she said over the last few weeks, which I thought was very interesting. But, again, she is the hype person, calculated hype person, I guess you could say, for her husband, Mike Nuss, who needs this win more than anything, in my opinion. So, what were your overall thoughts on this interview and Maria's take on tonight's match that Mike, I guess, really chose to be in. Uh, I like the interview a lot. I think Maria Canellis is uh, very underrated on the mic. I feel like not a lot of people talk about that because she's, she hasn't been known to like be like one of the best wrestlers and stuff, but I feel like she's very good on the mic, a very good manager. I do kind of like that the 205 Live has done this a couple of times now where uh, – like, if her and her husband are being interviewed, she'll do the interview because it's a callback to, uh, you know, when she first came to the WWE, she was an interviewer. Uh, right. And not good at it, but, you know. <laughs> well, who was truly a good interviewer back then wasn't yeah. I came. I mean, Terry Reynolds, during one interview segment, she became hardcore champion and then immediately lost it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, I thought it was great. You know, it really establishes a... Uh, Mike Canellis and makes you believe that he could win this match, um, and it gives gives you purpose about why the match is happening in a way. So I thought this interview did what it was supposed to do. So yeah. So moving on from there, we get of course first off DX going into the Hall of Fame. Congrats to them. Some of my favorite moments. So I gotta include the limo on the mic thing, but moving on. Yeah. Uh, get a squash match. Called it. Ari Davari faces a jobber named uh, Johnny Lyons. And, I mean, there wasn't much really shown here besides Ari Davari just proving how much he's trying to put himself over and says he can do this on his own and prove it. He basically comes out and says, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the beginning of the Davari De Niro destruction. The Triple D, I guess you can call it, of 205 Fly for the Cruiserweight division, where nobody will be able to can sue the ref for the wrong call. And then, of course, we get... Cheap heat from a heel where he talks about, hey, I'm going to my company Super Bowl like the New Orleans Saints. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not sports. I'm sorry. The only sport I follow, yes, I call it a sport, sue me. The only sport I follow is wrestling. Amateur, professional, big, small, etc. Indie, sporting wrestling, folks. So I have no idea whether the New Orleans Saints ever been to the Super Bowl. Y'all want to discuss that? Feel free to. I don't watch football. Sorry. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> but, but basically this match was literally squashed. There was a fury of uh, exchange into the corner. Johnny had one spot in here with a drop kick, and then he gets dropped with another step up kick, almost an insecure by Ari Davari in the corner. Yet somehow he did get Let's Go Johnny chance, so hey, good on him. I guess he must be popular with the local crowd, or maybe the heel just put him over with that cheap heat call against their football team. I don't know. Are they yeah. football team? Oh, God, I'm proving how naive uh I am. Well, yeah, because he said Super Bowl, so I, don't, I oh, think so. Okay, yeah, yeah. I know the Super Bowl is football. That much I do know, okay? Anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sports say? either, so. Okay, good. So it's not just me. Ladies and gentlemen, not everybody in America watch or does sports. Simple as that. It's not weird. It is a thing. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> uh, anyway, following this, pretty much sum it up. That hammerlock lariat and then Cobra Clutch. A variation of the Million Dollar Dream, instant tap out, that's it. So, yeah, pretty short match, basically reinserting himself into the 205 Live uh, picture and whether or not he could be a viable contender towards the title. Whether or not he will be in the tournament, who knows at this point. Only Drake Maverick will decide that, and we'll get into that later, ladies and gentlemen. But, Owen, what were your thoughts on basically Tavares' return to in-ring? I thought he looked... Uh... Pretty good, and obviously this is a way to build somebody up by just having them have squash, squash matches. I wish Raw and SmackDown would do this a lot more, because um, obviously, you know, uh, it, it it makes people a big threat and stuff. Um, only, like, little complaints. 
is I hate when uh, wrestlers use the, you know, sports, um, you know, putting down the city sports to get cheap heat. I just think it's cheap heat. And, and if you have to do that, it's just lazy, um, you know, to get somebody as a heel. The only time it worked was when Elias and Kevin Owens did it. That's how you do it. Right. That was uber heat. Man, yeah. that booing went on for 10 minutes. That was yeah. insanity. I completely agree. Beyond that, I mean, it's like control C, control V. Aha! Because that's a typical thing a heel will do. They will say your town sucks or they will belittle some form of your sports team, because some towns have multiple sports teams. I mean, yeah. when the new Jay O'Brien was in town last week for SmackDown Live, he didn't belittle the mud hands, he just belittled the city. Yeah. Fickle! Anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, so following that, we get a, a promo from the champ. He basically literally puts over uh, Drake Maverick's decision, and basically I guess how he and him both talked about this tournament coming together, and he gave props to the manager for doing this. Because, again... The general manager, Drake Maverick, the former rock star spot of TNA for such impact wrestling, he basically is trying to give him the best possible challenge possible. And then he basically, Buddy Murphy, he runs down literally his cruiserweight title history, starting with his bout with Mustafa Ali, where he left Ali hot broken. Then he talked about Alexander, where the edge of Alexander came crashing down. Then he talked about the Royal Rumble, where how he went up against the leader of the Luchadors, a striker, and he actually acknowledged the desire a little better this time. But, cheap callback, I like it, he said, and also the guy that defrowned the king of the cruiserweight. I really wonder what Pac thinks of all this, but I don't follow his social media that much, so I have no idea. And then, he talked about, of course, his recent bout at Elimination Chamber, where he basically, um, you know, Akira had another shot, failed, and he had his hand held high. So now, he spoke to Drake, and Drake came up with his eight-person tournament, where they're trying to find the next great cruiserweight to face him as he once again continues to prove why he is the greatest cruiserweight of all time. So who's it going to be to face him on the grandest stage in the mall? And a damn sure better not be on kickoff, because 205 Live deserves better. It deserves not to be on the kickoff show, but the main card. But I digress. What were your thoughts on this Buddy Murphy promo? Very good. Um, it made him, you know, I liked how he broke down his title and I even liked how he discussed, like, how uh, he feels for Drake Maverick because he's trying to do the best he can to win a show. But if he has a champion that's unstoppable on the show, because he pretty much is unstoppable. Buddy Murphy, I don't even think, has lost a match since he's been the champion. So, um, it's just awesome. And um, it, it just shows what everybody's fighting for, and it really makes me want to see this tournament. Um, obviously, when we finish reviewing this show, I think we should talk about some names that, that also could be in the tournament. Absolutely. Um, and, but, yeah, I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, s- seeing who he faces. And uh, I think this is going to be the last we see of him, you know, up until the tournament's over. I think we'll see him, like, here and there, but he won't have, like, a match on the shows or anything like that. But it was just an awesome uh, backstage segment. I agree. I-, I could see him maybe doing, like, a filler match because, you know, He's got this overwhelming confidence about him, and he might feel still, maybe just want to just prove and remind people how great he is on the road, to, up, up to the road to WrestleMania. I could see him doing a filler match, maybe not necessarily a fast lane, maybe not even for the title, but somewhere in between. Now, whether or not that happens and who it could be against, that's way up in the air. But yeah. that's, that's just a thought I'm thinking about, because I feel like we're going to see at least one more match for Buddy Murphy before WrestleMania, but I don't think it's going to be a title battle at this point, especially with Fastlane being so dang close. Yeah, it's March 10th. Yes, now we'll be going there live, too, representing no DQ. I cannot wait. But anyway, so now we go into our main event, where the opportunist, as he calls himself, Mike Canales takes on the soul of 205 Live, Cedric Alexander. Where, in my opinion, and the commentators even put this over, Mike, ultimately, he needs to win. But in a way, Cedric Alexander, he needs to win, too, because two weeks ago, he failed to win the fail four-way, kind of been on a flop since. So, but they also brought the point he did win the last tournament, apparently across the street, that culminated at that WrestleMania match. One of my favorite matches from that WrestleMania. He and Mustafa Ali tore the house down. Yeah. Did not deserve to be on kickoff. But I like They even um, showed the footage of that, too. Yes, which I truly respect. So, we get a heck of a barn burner match here. Let me see what I can do here. Oh, jeez. So, basically, we start out with a little bit of a feeling out process. There's some side headlocks. Cedric Alexander, by the way, 
crowd was hot for Cedric. So obviously they remember that match too. Whether or not it was on the Titan Tron or whether or not they just remember that his the boy, I don't know. Mad props by the New Orleans crowd respecting the NXT town and 205 Live. Lafayette, you seriously disappointed me. Then yeah. again, I've never been to your city, so I don't even know if you're a WWE town. According to Monday night, you sure as hell don't look like it to me. Yes, I just went heel. I just belittled the town. Sue me. Anyway. Well, uh, I, want, I wonder if they did any uh, trivia at Lafayette, um, you know, like any nickname trivia like they did at your town. So, because <laughs> it cause, uh, Cause I don't, I don't think they did very well. Maybe they, but uh, what was I gonna say? They probably reacted too, cause you know they've seen Cedric compete like on WoW and stuff too, so they they probably are familiar with him. Uh, Mike Canales, they're probably a little bit familiar with, but not probably more so Cedric, cause Mike Canales went off the radar for for a while. So right, and in my opinion, I think he's still trying to figure out himself. But this match, I think, once again. In essence, to uh, what Drake Maverick says, another incredible showing. So, uh, yeah, crowd was hot for Cedric. Cedric maintained control for most of this match in the beginning. Vicious chops, back and forth, back and forth, constantly, constantly, constantly. And then a kick to the back of the head into our first near fall by uh, Cedric. Then Mike, he gets his first real shot in with a vicious right hand, dropping Cedric from the top rope. As Cedric tries to go for a springboard attempt, I feel like. Maria, of course, applauding. By the way, Maria, not a commentary this week, because I guess the commentary thinks that Aiden disrespected her last week, asking the hard-hitting questions. Aiden English, I think, is doing a very good job on commentary. He really puts over the wrestlers, and he really puts over how each person contributes to a five life, what they also need to do to really prove themselves in the two of life division. I think he and Nigel have great chemistry. I just wish Vic would stop saying, take down so damn much. Yeah. I also liked it, this match. I waited English even brought up, uh, like, even though, like, he's been shitting all over uh, Mike Canellis, uh, that he actually feels for him because he's been in his position before. Uh, and he absolutely he, has. Before Rusev Day, what was the last noble thing Aiden English was doing? Yeah, nothing. Rusev. I would <laughs> say he's still, he's still probably in that position, too, because he got squashed by Rusev and, then, and stuff, so. Yeah, and that storyline just got cut away immediately, but... Yeah, SmackDown Live. Still better than Raw, but I digress. So, going back to this match. Sorry, folks. Uh, basically, Mike, uh, he calls himself the best in the world. Uh, anytime I hear that anymore, it just irks me. Who truly is the best in the world? Is it the new Daniel Bryan? Is it Chris Jericho? Is it CM Punk? Is it Shane McMahon? No, it's not fucking Shane McMahon. That's yeah, totally it is. He won guy. the tournament, buddy. He won the tournament. It's Shane McMahon. Bullshit! 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 He's not the best in the world! Don't <laughs> shit don't be on this! I just started a new season of 205 Live called Ranting! Because you're gonna make me rant on duck, 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 blood money fucking Saudi Arabia! Duck. Uh, <laughs> anyway, going back to this. Anyway, we get uh, elbows, a uh, basement kick, he's showing ruthless aggression, I like to think. And then basically we get a flare reference from the commentary as Cedric. He delivers a bunch of chops. We get a row through cover. Mike delivers another right hand and sends Cedric into the uh, middle turnbuckle. Both men right now, they seem uh, exhausted at this point. Mike always seems exhausted, though, in my opinion. I don't know how well his cardio is. But, hey, he went the distance in this match. I think this match was, like, maybe 15, 20 minutes. So, anyway, uh, following that, we get the uh, springboard elbow strike and then a – oh, no, I'm sorry. Spinning back elbow strike. Not as good as Andrade Sinanamas. I feel Andrade delivers more. Andrade Sinanamas, fuck first name curse. Andrade Sinanamas delivers more with his. But it was still nice. And then we get his neuralizer, that springboard uh, handstand kick. Then Cedric, shades of the fatal four-way. Botch, I feel, or intentional, I don't know. He slips in the exact same spot off the yeah. top rope and almost looks like he botches his right knee, which, of I course, that... he immediately capitalizes. He follows up on I feel like this was just to put Mike over strong and make it seem more believable that he could win. Or I maybe some excitement yeah. on him. I, I'm not sure. but I think it was intentional because, uh, like, he went right after the knee right afterwards. And typically, uh, you know, they would just, uh, you know, they would have probably done the X sign or they probably, you know, would have stopped yeah. the match for like a couple minutes. So I think this was actually intentional. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, to be fair, they haven't done the X sign since that crazy apron spot with Hideo and Tommy and Mustafa Ali. That made you not have to say, oh my lord! Yeah. And, yeah, it was a good match, too. But anyway, uh, continuing on from this, he capitalizes, falls on the knee. Maria seems uh, a little... Oh, no, wait. I'm sorry. Uh, 
capitalizes, falls on the knee. Cedric, he gets a few uh, near falls in there, though. Gets an inside cradle. I don't know where Cedric lands a super kick. But again, sell on the knee, sell on the leg. He couldn't capitalize, so he couldn't fall up on the cover. We get a first attempt at the lumbar check. That was countered. Then Cedric goes for another neuralizer. That was countered. And then Mike plants Cedric. I almost shades of a Falcon Arrow, maybe a mix of a Mr. Open Driver, not quite, into uh, another near fall that really had Maria up. One point, Maria takes off her jacket. No idea why. Uh, we get up cut, right hand kick, and another right hand. Both men just going back and forth. And then we get what they call a backpack stunner, which I think makes the most sense, where he just packages him behind, just drops him jaw first into another near fall. You could tell at this point, Mike, he shows visible frustration. This is usually where he cracks into the pressure. But this match went actually a lot longer than uh, I first anticipated. Sutter then gets a uh, roll-up in there. There's a missed kick by Mike into another small package. And we get a backslide. Once again, Cedric trying to sell the leg, really trying to prove that. Following this, we get a uh, backslide, and then after this, beautiful Miss Noku Driver saves up Super Showdown. Another near fall on, uh, like Buddy Murphy, but no, kick out. Match keeps going. Both men fight for control. Eventually, both men get on the apron. Both men, they eat each other's boots. The interesting thing is Cedric Alexander, he lands on the apron, while Mike, he lands on the floor. But Cedric, he goes basically after him. I don't know why he would do that, but I, I mean, it does make sense. He's a face. Faces don't usually want to win by count out, but... I feel like this had to be planned by Mike because Mike, he basically lures Cedric into a false sense of control and security and just snap plants him with a spine buster on the diamond grate. Cedric screaming in agonizing pain. I can only imagine how that felt. That got a vocal action for the audience too with the, oh. It reminded me of uh, the Tony Storm Rhea Ripley match when Rhea Ripley became the first NXT UK Women's Champion when she took the backdrop on the apron and she was crying like that. Yeah, true visible emotion, true pain. Of course, both to their credit, they continued uh, their matches. So, hey, good on them. So, uh, following that, we get a very near countout victory, nine and seven eighths. Eventually, uh, Mike, he's just infuriated again. He goes for a submission hold, Boston Crab. But Cedric, he grinds to the point, finding his thumb, nearly tapping out, really selling it. But he makes it to the bottom rope for a rope break. Maria, he's just, just in sense. She's like, what does my husband have to do? Why is he not winning? But Mike, he just cannot get Cedric to tap out. So uh, Mike, he sent over the top rope in frustration. After he goes after Cedric, Cedric sends over the top rope. Cedric, somehow, he goes over the top rope himself with uh, his own high fly maneuver, where Maria just seems absolutely shocked. And as Cedric throws, throws Mike into the ring, Maria comes into play like, no, 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 no. You stay out here. You leave him alone. Maria finally coming into play. I knew she had to come and play at some point. Yeah. And in the end, she almost did because when Cedric finally bypassed her, which really, why it took this long for Cedric to bypass Maria, I have no idea. Uh, basically, he uh, blocks Cedric. Basically, he runs straight into another super kick from Mike Knuzz into a twisting DDT, a corkscrew DDT, I guess you could call it into what I truly thought was the end of the match. I really thought he won here, but this isn't Raw. This isn't SmackDown Live. The refs have a brain. Go freaking figure. And they actually proved it to the audience, too, on replay. Even the commentary. He'll commentary now to begin is put this over, because you can't argue with facts. At yep. two and seven and eight, Cedric Alexander, he got his right shoulder up. I couldn't believe it. Following that, just Maria screaming, Mike, be on the point. Well, that's, like, that's not... Because the ref actually counts three, but when he sees that his shoulder, he yeah. like, realizes like a split second his shoulder's up, and he's like, no, no, the match continues and stuff. So. Great call by John Cohn. Very good officiating. And great work by the camera crew, too. Not only just capitalizing on that on replay, but really just the way they tape it. Again, WWE, they really have great video management. I will give them all the credit for that in the world. It's probably one of the only things they get right most of the time. But, yeah, following this... Um, Mike Knells, he tries to uh, go and capitalize uh, for it, and we get a cover attempt, but eventually, well, who am I kidding, eventually? Literally after this, Cedric finally hits his lumbar check, which nobody, but Lane Murphy apparently, I think, is the only person at this point, has kicked out, and slow to capitalize, crossing the cover, he still pins Mike Knellis, one, two, three. So once again, Mike Knellis, incredible performance, cannot get the win on the losing end. 
Cedric Alexander with his first huge win in weeks. But definitely damage done. What an incredible bout. I don't know if I would say this is better than the no-DQ match last week, but this is definitely one of Cedric Barrett's showings, and I feel like for Mike Knows, this was his best match so far, even on his losing streak. Oh, and what are your overall thoughts on this match? This match was great. Um, this really awesome back-and-forth match. Love the story that it told with Mike Kanellis, like, trying to get his win, um, but just can't quite do it. The selling by Cedric Alexander in this match. I Obviously, the ending, you, well, not like, quite the end, but, like, the tease of the end um, and the way he was shot and stuff, that was great. Um, just everything was, just this match had, I think, everything in it. And I think the right person went over. Um, I, I don't know what this means for Mike Kanellis, um, you know, because uh, he still continues his uh, losing streak. I think there is going to be the match. Maybe the match will be one of the matches in the tournament, but it, it really wouldn't make sense for him to go in the tournament because he hasn't won a match since then. It's very un-Drake Maverick-like to put someone in a tournament that hasn't been win. So, um, yeah. yeah, but this match was just great. Um, great way to end off, like, you know, because this was the last match the live crowd saw, too, unless they did a dark match afterwards. But um, it was great. Um, and like I said, right person uh, went over. Because I don't think Cedric's had, like, a big win in a while. Um, so, yeah. I can't... Yeah, I, I enjoy this. Again, the match, people will remember the name Mike Knows. I'm sure I'll remember his name, but I don't know if this is what Maria entails. I don't even know what Maria truly feels like at this point or what her next plan is because she looks shocked, she looks infuriated, and then she has that evil, glaring smile, and it comes to comfort her husband, who's just absolutely distraught. Who knows where these two go from here at this point? It's completely up in the air. But... Anyway, following this, we go straight into the back office where we finally learn half of the participants in this tournament, where Drake Maverick puts over that he had to take a lot of thought and consideration into this, but he looked at people for the recent performances and past accomplishments, and we literally get our show for next week, basically. It's going to be Kalisto versus Tony Nese and the Brian Kendrick versus Drew Gulak. Now, I find these four people very interesting because... All four of these people are very well-known names from the 205 Live roster. And two of them are former champs. Two of them have yet to win the gold. Yeah. So I'm very interested in how both these matches play out, especially the Drew Gulak one, because you know Jack Gaga would be in his corner. And I feel like for the Carrillo, he's probably going to be watching near two. Whether or not he'll be in the corner or watch from where TV angle, who knows. Or maybe this will pause, actually, that Roberto Carrillo storyline. I'm very curious, but I'm calling it right now, despite the other four, I would like Drew Gulak to become Cruiserweight Champion for this year. I don't see him facing Buddy Murphy WrestleMania, but I hope it does happen at some point. I'm also curious to see who the other four are going to be, whether or not they bring somebody else on the 205 Live banner, like me and Cindy talked about. Hell, maybe Roderick Strong, he participated in the first tournament, and we don't know what direction the dispute era is going right now at this point. But, yeah, I'm very curious to see these matches uh, next week. So, Owen, what are your thoughts on the two matches, the participants so far, and who else do you think could go into this tournament? Well, I like uh, the participants that they announced. You know, they make sense. Tony Nese just had that big win against Noam Dahl in the Nodi Q match. Uh, Drew Gulak has been very impressive lately. Um, and he's like, you know, one of the originals of 205 Live. The Brian Kendrick, you know, recently just changed up his look. And he's also been very impressive lately. Former Cruiserweight champion. And Kalisto, you know... Um, former Cruiserweight champion, and 205 Live probably thinking if he wins, he'll be taking the title to Raw, which, you know, might maybe think he's never, he's probably never won the Cruiserweight title because I think they made Raw so wants that title far away from Raw, so. Oh, absolutely. I mean, shoot, unless you're freaking Lucha House Party, Cruiserweight division don't matter. 205 Live matters, folks, still about that, but Raw doesn't give a shit. Lucha but uh, as for what else we'll think we in the tournament, probably because of his win uh, last night, well, two nights ago, because it's been, like past midnight now. Um, Cedric Alexander will win. Well, not win, but be in the tournament since, you know, he won the last year's tournament and he just beat Mike Kanellis on this show. Right. Um, Leo Rush, since he was undefeated before in 205 Live, and Bobby Roberto Carrillo, I would like to see, like, an NXT superstar be in it. Um, maybe Roderick Strawn, um, that's about the only one I can think of. I would like to see some NXT UK representation, but the problem is is one of the people can't be in the tournament, so 
I would sacrifice Humberto Carrillo and put Tyler Bates in there instead. Oh, uh, wow. Oh, it sounds like you're calling for like a mustache mountain breakup or literally a class of the world. Tyler well, Bates, cruiserweight champion? That would be incredible. Well, I'm not saying that he would be cruiserweight champion because uh, when they did the tournament last year, they called up like Roderick Strong and Tyler Bates just for like, you know, on a one-off appearance just to be in these tournaments. Right. Uh, so... I don't Super think I was also in a rebuilding stage. Remember, this was the first that that tournament last year was literally the reincarnation of 205 Live ran by Triple H. Showing off more as a real wrestling product with legitimate competitors and built stories versus some cartoony bullshit by Vince McMahon and a champ that no one ever wants to mention again. Yeah. Well, uh if they don't if they if they just want to stick to just the 205 Live roster though, you could just throw in a Berta Carrillo um, and TJP, you know, since TJP was the first ever cruiserweight champion, you know, under this brand of it, so. Right. Uh, I, I think those would be, like, the four. Um, okay. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I feel like Ari Devari would be too soon to put in this. I can't imagine both Jack Gallagher and Andrew Gulak being in this tournament. I don't see another member of the Lucha House Party being in this tournament. Leo Rush... Who knows what's going on with him, but you're right. Besides the loss of Cedric, he has had a very good uh, record and performance on 205 Live. And again, I mean, if they're not going to bring in somebody from the SUK brand like you referenced, I think Tyler Bay would be an incredible star. Heck, Mark Andrews even been on 205 Live. He's faced yeah. champ before. Uh, and they're not going to like bring in like Roderick Strong or maybe hell, Ray Mendoza or, or some other surprise from NXT. Then, yeah, I could totally see uh, Leo Rush, Roberto Carrillo, maybe Ardivari, and Sarah Alexander filling in the other four. Because right now, between these four in the tournament, you basically got two heels and two faces. You're balanced. And I don't see them putting Akira Tozawa in here again because Akira Tozawa just had his, um, well, he had two attempts at the title. Yeah. I don't really know what you could do from him from, do with uh, Akira Tozawa uh, from here. So, yeah. And I'm just curious to see um, who are going to be uh, the other four and also who's going to win both these matches. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, predict both these matches. Who do you see winning both these matches next week? Um, Tony Nese for, uh, you know, Kalisto. Um, and this one's tough, the Kendrick Gulak one, because they've both been on a roll. I'll say uh, Gulak because I want Gulak to win, so... <laughs> I, 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 205 live yeah we need a better 205 live so we need Gulak to be champ for that to happen well I think Drew Gulak he's been I believe he was in like the semifinals if not the finals of the last tournament because I know he faced Mustafa Ali and Mustafa Ali had to go for him to get Sarah Alexander Drew yeah. Gulak is a very viable contender I feel to go along in this tournament whether or not he wins the whole thing because again your champ right now is a really really overconfident heel it's hard to say. I have to say right now, I feel like I agree with you. Tony Nese definitely has to get past Kalisto at this point. And Drew Gulak, he will be a viable contender to go for, especially if Cedric Alexander is one of the other four. Because I can see this coming down to Cedric Alexander versus Drew Gulak. Again, as much as people may not want to see Cedric Alexander again at WrestleMania, Cedric Alexander is one of your most viable contenders for the title. He gave Buddy Murphy his best match ever, probably. And that was only uh, ten minutes. Yeah, I think you. I think he did actually. Actually, yeah. Yeah, it was probably only. It was probably the most legitimate, memorable thing from Super Showdown too, because no one else remembers anything from that show except me, because I also support the Iconics, future of women's tag team chats, in my opinion. I, I enjoyed that match too. But anyway, so yeah, and uh, I feel like those two matches alone will probably take up the whole show next week because I don't see them doing anything else furthering uh, Habito Carrillo at this point. I don't see them doing anything else with uh, Akira Dozawa. Maybe we get a promo from Leo Rush. I'm, I'm sure we're going to learn about the other four uh, next week as well. Ari Devari, he might do some sort of promo. But beyond that, I don't really see anything else happening next week on uh, 205 Live. And I definitely don't see TJP showing up next week on 205 Live. I think he's literally just the Dolph Ziggler at this point, And he's going to be, you know... Fan of security. I think uh, the next few weeks will just be the focus on the tournament. Um, Without doubt. I think the finals will take place at uh, maybe Fastlane, just because, uh, you know, I think there's uh, – this because Fastlane's the 10th, so they're going to want to do um, these four match, you know, these two matches next week, then there'll be another two, 
and like they'll do the quarterfinals. Right. I mean, so I think the, I think the finals will take place at Fast Lane, not on the kickoff though. Don't do that. Don't Thank don't you. do that. Especially because I will be pissed off like a motherfucker. Yeah, I said, excuse me, motherfucker, because I'll be there live. If I see the freaking cruiserweights on the kickoff again, I'm going to be pissed. Tony, quit speaking for WWE. Best for business, my ass. You guys belong on the main card. You certainly are better than fucking corporate Baron Corbin and the recreated authority 4.0. What the fuck, Drew, Drew, Drew McIntyre and Bobby Lashley? Damn. Yeah. But I digress. Um... Yeah, I thought, but uh, yeah. So anyway, I thought this was another uh, great show. Uh, let's go ahead and grade the whole show overall. On a scale of one to five, what would you grade this week's episode of Two Hundred Five Live? Um, I'll go uh, a four. Really, no uh, issues with it. Like nothing was wrong with it. Everything flowed well. There's typically like never anything bad on Two Hundred Five Live. So, um, I. I that's really tough to. I think the last thing that happened bad on 205 Live was when it was in its own reincarnation. So. Don't remind me. Yeah. Okay, that's a fair grade. Yeah, uh, looking at both these matches, Mike Canellis, he still shows aggression. So did Alexander, Mike Canellis tore the house down. I like the opener. I like how it's building this storyline between this possible uh, trifecta of Drew Gulak, Jack Gallagher, and Humberto Carrillo. So, yeah, uh, let's see. Last week I gave it 4.5, but also I was a, lit, I was a bit biased because I saw it live. Uh, yeah, I think this week I'm going to go for maybe four and a quarter because I feel like something has to give for Mike Kanellis. I could see him somehow inserting himself into this tournament. Maybe not as a participant, but maybe even costing Cedric Alexander at this point, who's probably your most favorite to win this as well. Because I have no idea where Mike goes from here, but he needs to do something. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, this was another great episode, great discussion. First off, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me this week on 205 Live. A special thank you to my guest this week, the Talkinator, Owen Finch. Owen, where can people find you? They can find me on, uh, you know, three YouTube channels. Um, the CM Brothers, which is the first one. Um, that's just... You know, what my spam YouTube account and stuff like that. But I do post some videos on there here and there. Um, me and my cousin are finally going to get that Red vs. Blue Volume 1 up. Um, hopefully nice. this, this either this week or, you know, next week. We're finally going to do that. So um, check, be on the lookout for it. I know we've been saying it for like, you know, a month. But um, we always say we are and then we just never do. <laughs> um, and also check out, you know, um, Owen the Talkinator. Um at some point this week, because I missed Walking Dead this week because of Elimination Chamber, we're going to find out if it was worth it or not. So I'll have my review of Season 9, Episode 10. Um, yeah, And no, not, you know, Ty Dillinger 10, actually Episode 10. He, he's gone, never coming back. So, <laughs> uh, And then obviously Wrestling Fortune 44, where me and Noah do the uh, Wrestling Rundown, which their episode will be up Saturday or Sunday. We don't know yet. Um, it will be recorded Saturday, but, you know, we don't right. know if it will be up Sunday or not. And obviously we'll be doing the, um, not me and Noah, but me and James, uh, James Archangel will be doing the Retro Wrestling Review Series. This week it was my pick, and since Fighting With My Family, the actual movie comes out, we're going to be reviewing the Fighting With My Family documentary that came out, like, in 2012, so that would be fun. Nice. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I can't think of anything. Oh, and also, uh. If you ever want to be on, like, a future wrestling rundown, you can find me via Instagram. My Instagram account name is, believe it or not, Finch Owens. Very generic, but that's just the name they gave me, and I ain't changing it because it's been that way for a while. And I guess you can hit me up on Facebook, too, because um, it's called um, Owen Finch. Uh, what, you got, what you should do, though, is when, if you friend me, just message me so I know you're not, like, you know, a spam account. But I have a trolling robots. Yeah. I have a feeling that's not going to happen, though, so... I'm just going to have to – and by the way, no, when am I going to get that championship behind you? Because that's my belt right there. That's <laughs> – when are you going to give me that belt? I, I, oh. I don't know. I paid a lot of money for that. So, I mean, I got to make a postage and <laughs> – You hold it out on me. Yes, I know. Until I, get, until I get that belt, this, this way here will be the official NXT No DQ championship that I'll hold until I get that uh, – 
till I get that belt. Hey, at least my belt looks better than Matt Taven's Purple Ring of Honor belt. That thing's a piece of shit. Yeah. But anyway, I digress. All right. Say, oh, also, congratulations to the Stephen Osborne for representing the NXT No DQ team. Um, you know, by winning the Elimination Chamber predictions. So if, if only he could have won the Takeover ones, that would have been better. But yeah, I'd be dual champion. But hey, we got you for that because, folks, No DQ NXT team, we're a league of our own. Simple as yeah. that. All right, well, and folks, if you want to find me, you can look me up, nodq.com forward slash Noah. It takes you to my Twitter page. Look up my YouTube channel if you want, where you will find this series, 205 Live Matters, Pay-Per-View Predictions, WWE and Beyond, and monthly rest create unboxings. I'll be unboxing this guy right here, my February crate. You can look up my channel at uh, youtube.com forward slash users forward slash Noah Foster 210. And folks, above all else, just keep supporting uh, NoDQ.com, okay? Go buy a shirt, NoDQ.com for a stress shirt. Check out our playlist. Just look up hashtag Team NoDQ. Near 5,000 songs on there. Everything from uh, Hootie and the Blowfish to Blue, Oy- Blue Oyster Cult to uh, George Michael, etc. And go check out, like I said, NoDQ.com. There's an opinion uh, section for everything because, folks, not only does 205 Live Matters, but you... You, no DQ guys and beyond, your opinions matter too, because we all are no DQ. And as always, folks, support your wrestling outlets, both big and small, and let's keep growing this wrestling community together. Simple as that. So with that, thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in to this extended episode of 205 Live Matters. We'll be back next week with a new episode discussing the outcome so far of the first matches of the eight-man single elimination cruiserweight tournament. Owen, thank you again, sir, for being my guest. It was you know what? Pleasure. You're going to inspire me. I want to try to get a main event matters show going. <laughs> hey, why not? More <laughs> wrestling better, right? Also, folks, stay tuned as I'm trying some other stuff, too. There might be some independent content coming in ODQ. I'm going to be doing my first ever indie review. I'm going to call it an indie view with an uh, independent promoter here in my hometown, Toledo, Ohio. And I'm Gary. Look out for that on my YouTube channel. And with that, thank you again to everybody. And I'm just a simple man and a lifelong fan of wrestling. So until next week, everybody, have a good night. Have a good night, guys.